Hey everybody, I'm Eric Mueller, and welcome back to The Eric Mueller Show. You've tuned into the podcast that explores what makes any successful person's inner clock tick. Today on the show, you'll be hearing from a former Division I athlete who has extensive experience in both digital marketing and search engine optimization. Joey Myers played four years of Division I baseball at Fresno State, and he's now an Amazon best-selling author in the baseball coaching niche. He currently runs a search engine optimization agency, where the focus is on the four pillars of online success, Google Maps, Google Organic, quality link building, and measurement through data analytics. Most recently, Joey has curated standard operating procedures to train virtual assistants on doing company outreach tasks, such as lead generation, podcasting, company acquisition, affiliate marketing, and partnerships. Joey has the expertise and foresight to help any business grow and scale. I hope that you're eager to hear what Joey has to say about ranking a business on the very first page of Google. Let's head on over to the interview. All right, so welcome back to the Eric Mueller Show. Today, I have the pleasure to interview a fellow collegiate athlete. His name is Joey Myers. Joey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Appreciate it, man. You know, I I think it for me this is really special because I really I've been wanting to talk to someone who, you know, went through some of the similar things that I did maybe as a as a collegiate athlete and student athlete. So, first and foremost, here, how has being an athlete influenced your personal and professional development? Great question. And I still work with a lot of hitters in the baseball softball niche. One of my biggest websites that I've been working since probably 2000, well, since 2008, really, but it became hittingperformancelab.com in 2013, I think. But I said work with hitters online and coaches online, but hitters locally. And one of the big things that I stress to them is I say, I'm teaching you how to hit, Um, whether it's mechanics, whether it is hitting approach, whatever it is, moving better. I'm teaching you hitting, but it is life through hitting. So the big thing that I teach my hitters that you understand is being a collegiate athlete. And I think it's different than being a high school athlete. College just goes beyond where you have some other things that you have to do, like with this, the classes. And if you have to go to study hall and you're dealing with the college life and that, that kind of thing goes beyond, I think the high school side of it, but critical thinking, critical thinking skills. That's the thing that especially in, and I know track and field too, you guys definitely could use a lot more probably critical thinkers like we can in baseball and softball. But I think that's probably one of the best skills that, and some people come, their software, they're really good critical thinkers. And some of us have to hone that skill and have to get better at using that part of our brain and building that skill up. But that is one of the biggest skills that I stress to my my hitters is critical thinking. You have to critical think. You can't take somebody's word for it. You definitely need to obviously listen to your coach, your coach is, but listen to them always skeptically and don't question them in a bad way. It could be in your own mind, but question what they're telling you and fact check that yourself. Go on your own and check, is this the right way to do this thing? Or is this mindset, does this work for me? If it doesn't, then what else can I use? But again, it's it's life. It's it's life through sport is what the big thing that I always stress to my hitters. Sure. Yeah. And a, a thought that comes to my mind, I know that it was thrown around when I was getting out of high school and going to pursue. Uh, I did division three athletics, whereas you did division one, but you know, you're still in a, in a you know kind of rare group, so to speak. Right. I, I remember the statistic being thrown at me was that about 6% of uh, high school athletes will play in college. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I mean, from my point of view and, and you being, you know, an entrepreneur and and leading a business and authoring books, um, has that shaped the way that you persevere through, you know, some of those situations where people might say, you know, you're not going to make it or, or you, you know, you're going to be in the minority if you, if you get that far? Yeah, great question. And I think that's one of the big things between being a high school athlete and not going beyond that and being a college level athlete. And, and D3 is, I had buddies who played D3 and they were just as good as, as I was, they they could have competed at D1 as well. They just maybe didn't get the look that I did, but to take the, um, to be able to persevere what you're talking about and push through because entrepreneurship for those out there that are entrepreneurs or serial entrepreneurs, it it's tough. And it was tough for me in the beginning. Again, it's honing a skill, but falling for the glittery object syndrome and seeing 
somebody's making a ton of money in real estate. And this is part of my story, a ton of money in real estate. Okay. Let me go get my real estate license. I knew what I needed to do to get there. But in the beginning, I was chasing money. I wasn't thinking about the investment side of it, thinking about the future family I was going to have, you know, the, the wife and then having the two kids. I was looking to, to make the buck and it made the journey to learning that those things of real estate, it made it a tougher, it made it, it made it really tough. I think you can have the the gumption to push through, the perseverance to push through, but you got to make sure that the burning why is there. Why do I really want to do this? Am I chasing money? And I would recommend to those newbies out there that are just graduating high school and getting into this and, and want to start their own business and things, all that's good, but you want to make sure, and this is what I learned later was the three Ps. You got the uh, people, you have the products, and then you got profit. <clears throat> so people need to be your first thing. If that's yourself, like you need to work on yourself or you have employees or you have partners, people, it, that's the first priority that you should be focusing on in your business. The second one being your products. So you need to make good products that are actually going to help people. If they don't help people and you're trying to sell a product that doesn't help people, then you're a charlatan, right? You're, you're selling something that is, isn't useful. You want to make sure that product is good and then the profits will follow. And of course, I, I like money coming in just like anybody does, but it's I've learned to not put people and the product behind the profits. And that's what I did early. So that would be my biggest advice for those that are starting out. That's awesome advice. Yeah, Joey, thank you so much. And it, it makes me think of a post I saw actually yesterday by Gary Vee. I don't know if you're a fan yeah. of, of Gary Vaynerchuk, but very motivational guy, very, very inspirational uh, entrepreneur. Um, his quote is, don't beat yourself up when you're working too little or too much. Focus on if you are happy and are the people you love happy. And that really struck home to me. I reshared that and, and posted it and was like, I definitely needed to hear that that day. And I think that was two days ago. But, you know, I, I'm definitely in that in that mindset a little bit right now. And I think some other audience members might share that is, you know, mm -hmm. chasing chasing that money or you see that, you know, you see those entrepreneurs that are that are getting that monetary success. But if they were doing it for the wrong reasons, they, they probably wouldn't have persevered that far. So I appreciate your sentiment there. And that, mm -hmm. that really helps, I think, tie tie a bow on that, that so to mm -hmm. speak. Right. And it does make me, you, you kind of mentioned, you know, a little bit about passion and what, what ke keeps you driven. So really my show, the backbone of this show is to explore what makes successful people tick, what makes their inner clocks stay driven towards the success that they're chasing. So Joey, what is the one single driving force that keeps your inner clock ticking towards success? Well, I think being a collegiate athlete my whole life, working towards something, uh, towards a goal, whether that's in high school is winning the Valley championships or, or being a national ranked nationally number one as a team, as a team. And in baseball and softball, that sport is so it's so individual, but it's not individual, right? We're a part of the whole. You got nine players on the field. You have a whole team of maybe 20 to 30 players or 14 players. Each individual has to contribute to the whole, right? So it's all about individual, but it's not individual. So what drives me uh, competition, but also the cooperation and the network of people being able to leverage yourself or what I was thinking when you were talking about <clears throat> that Gary V quote is being effective versus being efficient. So there's big difference there for those I'm sure listeners you have have know who Tim Ferriss is in the four hour work week. Oh, yeah. And Tim Ferriss talks a lot about that effectiveness versus efficiency and effectiveness is working on the right things. Efficiency is on doing those things right. So you can check your email all day, which I've fallen into that trap. Probably most listening to this have fallen into that trap. You just check email just to check email, just to be busy. Is that necessarily being effective? Now, if those emails are coming in and they're orders, they are offers, you are sending offers, maybe you're doing outreach. Now that's that's a different story. Although you probably should be having somebody else do that for you to, to be able to scale your business because you can't do that all day when you got other things to worry about. But making sure uh, the driving force <clears throat> is always good to have a, a have a sunset to be chasing. But you have to understand what are those effective things that you need to be doing in order to get to that sunset. So oh, every day questioning what I'm doing right now, is this going to take me on that? Is that going to get me to the end, to the sunset or to the pot of the gold at the end of the rainbow? Is that going to get me there? If that's not going to get me there, then I either should, I should stop doing it. But it could be something that is useful that I should be doing. So should I get somebody else to do it for me? 
Or is it something that I should be doing? Is it like negotiating? Am I a good negotiator? So maybe I should be the person there in a boardroom that's negotiating a deal. So there, you have to question it is what, what I'm doing right now. Is that effective? Is that going to lead me to whatever that end goal is and what I'm doing? If it's a podcast, creating a podcast, if it's becoming a number one best-selling author, is it so you have to keep questioning that throughout the day. And, and the more you do that, you keep that front of mind, the better your brain works in that sense. So anything, any kind of question comes up, any kind of email comes in, any kind of person tries to call you or text you, you, you start to, that's an automatic thought of, okay, if, if I respond back to this person, is this something that's going to help me move? Now, of course, you don't want to turn down your friends, you know, they call you, they text you, things like that. But you can do like what Tim Ferriss does. And you can batch all those things. You can say, okay, at one o'clock every day and four o'clock every day, I'm going to respond to those. But before that, and in between that, I'm just going to work on what's effective. So I would say <clears throat> having that passion, having that goal is being number one. And then the, the other thing is understanding what is effective and that staying on the effectiveness versus being efficient. Be efficient at the effective of what you're working on, right? Don't, don't be efficient first and then effective second. Yeah, that's, that's phenomenal. And there's a lot to unpack here. So there's a couple angles that I want to take with you here. I first just want you to share just a little bit about, uh, so your lead generation SEO services, the business that you have right now. For the audience members listening that maybe are new to this, would you just quickly share what SEO means, search engine yeah. optimization, what, what that is? Yeah, good question. So search engine optimization is if you do any kind of Google search or <clears throat> you do a DuckDuckGo search, it's what comes up, what results come up, on that first page, second page, third page. Usually we don't go beyond the second page of Google. Most searches end on the first page. So the first, I think, <clears throat> I heard this statistic, I think it's like 80, 88 to 92% of that first result on Google underneath the ads. So the ads, that's completely different. That doesn't include search engine optimization. People, when you see ad there, people are paying to be put in that, in that specific position. So the first result, that is underneath the ads that that one gets 88 to 92 percent of the traffic wow so when people search for certain terms and there's usually we group the terms into two different groups so we talk top of funnel and bottom of funnel so the difference between that is for a business think think about a brick and mortar maybe a, a roofer roofing roofing business so if I am targeting certain keywords to rank for on, on the first page of Google. I'm working on sending a bunch of backlinks to that page so that we call it link juice so that we can be pushed up in the search engine rankings, or we're doing like a, a write and rank type thing where we're, we're just putting a lot more content, really good content that, that our competitors don't. So for a roofer, if somebody's typing in the term, so a top of funnel keyword term would be like a general term. It would be like, uh, roofing, it'd be roofing, or it could be roofing, air conditioning, HVAC it could be some, something like that, or roofing tiles or roofing shingles, like types of roofing, right? Those are just people that are searching their top of funnel. They aren't ready to pull the trigger yet. They're just doing their research and they're trying to gather information. The difference in a bottom of funnel search, which a roofing business would want to make sure that they're ranking high for. And ironically, the bottom of funnel keywords you can rank easier for because they don't have a lot of searches, which some people go, well, I want to rank for the, the roofing tile or roofing, the type of roof, right? I want to rank high for that because it, it gets 10,000 searches a month or whatever it is. I don't know what, yeah. what it gets. I'd have to search it, but it gets 10,000 searches. I want to rank high for that because look at all that traffic, but see that traffic is all there for research. Now, if we look at best roofing contractors near me, now that's a lot of search. That's a lot of keywords in the search, but that is more of a bottom funnel or roofing contractor reviews near me, right? Best something like that. Now those are people that know what they want and they're looking to get estimates and they're looking to, they're more likely to pull the trigger. So that one might get a hundred, 200 searches a month. And you say, well, shoot, that's not that much compared to the 10,000. But see, those people are ready to go. They're ready to pull the trigger. And you don't have to spend a lot of time educating them. All you have to do is make sure your credibility indicators are, are there, your testimonials. You have really good testimonials and reviews and things like that. So for those out there that are looking to kind of tweak their search engine optimization or new to it, 
you want to, especially as a brick and mortar and, and especially online too, same, same type thing. You want to get the people that are at the bottom of the funnel and their search intent is, is a big deal when it comes to like our clients and, and who we work with in our agency. Yeah. So, so you, you really want to target people that are ready to buy. They're not just doing research. They're not doing preliminary data, you know, collection. They're, they're, they're looking to actually make, you know, take an action on, on those search terms that they're using. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to spend a lot of time on people that if, if you're not there to educate, like my hitting performance lab.com is there to educate. So I, I rank for hitting training, right? Hitting training isn't a buy search intent. It's more of to get them in and to educate. So I educate a lot on my site and I take them through a funnel. But when it comes to a business, a brick and mortar, especially like the roofing, we want to go right at those, those people that are red hot or else, I mean, how long do you want to educate them for a month? 60 days, 90 days until they finally buy. How about getting the people that are ready to go within the, within the week or two week or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's that gosh, that it's a lot to think about. I know that, um, you know, with my podcast here, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of niche down a little bit and try to try to develop the SEO. I know some listeners probably have some side hustles that they're working on some, you know, maybe they've become full fledged businesses or maybe they're still, you know, little passion projects, but for those of you listening, um, I will attach the, the link to lead generation, SEO services.com. Joey has some offers on there um, mm-hmm. for, for listeners of this show. You would get a discount, I believe, on his website. Mm-hmm. So and free I, stuff, I, free search uh, search audit, like a SEO audit. So we it's all free. And then if you wanted to hop on a call, we do that call free, and we just kind of lay things out. If there's any low hanging fruit, I can help with like that's that's right away, or that you can do, I can send you to do. Sometimes there's plugins on those that have websites on WordPress. Easy plugins you can plug in that make your site faster or allows for easier search engine optimization. So on page, when you're writing out your articles, it'll give you a whole diagram, like kind of like a mini audit for an on page audit. And you can go through that and make sure it's all green. It's, it's got a red, yellow, green light type thing. So when you addressed all the issues and it turns green, you're, you're good to go. So um, there are some things that we can do low hanging fruit. And then there's, you know, maybe those out there that want to pull the trigger and have us have us come on board with them. And, and we'd be good with that too. But there's a lot of free stuff there that we could, that we can help you with. Yeah. I think that's really valuable because I think a lot of people, and I could be wrong, but a lot of people listening, I think are, are probably operating on, on maybe minimal budgets with their, with their side hustles, including myself here. So if, sure. if a business has like what you might refer to as a shoestring budget, where mm-hmm. should they start with their marketing? I mean, I know that the services you offer, you know, probably are well within market range for, for pricing, but um, for a person like me, maybe kind of bootstrap the business, um, you know, it might be a little bit hard to invest a lot in SEO up front. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess what advice would you give someone that is on that end of the spectrum, as well as someone who has a business that has a decent budget, what mm-hmm. should they do with, with their search engine optimization? If you wouldn't mind sharing those two. Right, right, right. So for on the, the shoestring budget, I've been at both places and, and I, I take my medicine, I drink my own medicine. So when I was on a shoestring budget, when I first started building my own websites back in 2008, and it started with baseball, uh, swingsmarter.com. That's, I don't think it's up anymore, but we did mostly the content and the, so I was going through a program of software that helped with all the things I was, I was mentioning, but those that have a WordPress Yoast, why like toast, but with a Y at the, at the front. So Yoast sure. plug in. So there's a free one. I would suggest getting the premium, the buying the the premium one. If you have video, get the video. I think they have a bundle that's both the premium and the video. And I think it's for a year, it's 120 bucks or 130 bucks. And it's well worth it. You can try and do the regular. There's enough there that's free, right? You just download the plugin and and it has some features already in there. And one of the features was what I had uh, described where you got the red light, yellow light, green light on the SEO on your on-page stuff. So I think that's all included in the regular. And then the premium just gives you extra extra bells and whistles when it comes to search engine optimization. But that would be a first place to start. There are, for those out there, probably no Fiverr. Fiverr is one of my favorite places to go, oh, fiverr.com. Yeah. Like the like the five f i v e r r yep. dot com. So they have a lot of cool people on their contract sub subcontractors that you can peel off. And there are some probably that you want to spend a lot of your time on is speeding your site up. So there's a thing called AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages, A M P, and you want to find somebody on there who can convert. What we do is we just convert our mobile version into AMP. And we're actually currently doing that for lead generation SEO services.com. We did it before, but we did a, a site re, redesign where we we put instead of the 700 words of content, now it's like a three to four thousand 
a keyword pay or page word page a homepage. So we're we're redesigning that, turning that over to the AMP. So what AMP does is AMP gives you just the basic content, maybe some pictures and keeps links to a minimum, but it allows your page to load really, really fast. And Google over the last, well, over the last year, they've really, well, over the last actually couple months, they've turned up the, the link juice or the search juice on pages that are really, really fast, that load fast. So a way that you can check out if your site loads fast or not, is you can either go to uh, GT, G is in GOAT, T is in Tom metrics, M E T R I X.com gtmetrics.com. And you can just put your, your URL in there and it'll tell you how fast your, uh, your site loads <clears throat> and cool. it'll give you a grade. So it might be an F, it might be a D and there are things that are in there. It'll tell you what you can fix. So that is what you can take to a developer on Fiverr and say, Hey, can you, can you make this to where we turn this green? Wow. The other okay. one is Google page speed. And just just Google Google page speed and you can go in there, put your website in there and it'll Google will tell you what it'll give you a grade, uh, give you a number grade up to 100, 100 being like perfect. And it'll tell you mobily and desktop where you where your site falls in that. So that's a good starting point if you wanted to start <clears throat> really making your site fast. Um, so gtmetrics.com and then Google page speed and then using that Yoast plugin or, is a great way to start on bootstrap. I mean, those I think it cost us 135 bucks to amp my lead gen uh, site. So it's, it's not a lot, but for those that have a little bit of a budget that can, that can do that. Now on the other side, if you got a lot of budget, if you got a, you run into a website or a company out there and you got a decent sized budget, aside from those things, making sure those things are good is I would definitely go into conversion testing. So I would pay a, a company like Convertica like convertica.com, or I think they're .com. You can search them in Google, but sites like that, that will go in and set up testing, split AB testing stuff. If you're getting enough traffic to that, I mean, that's going to help if you're not getting a lot of traffic. Um, if, you, if you're doing pretty well, you probably are getting some decent traffic, but what they'll do is they'll do split tests and they'll work on conversions. So taking somebody from being a prospect, just landing on your site, greasing the shoot to get them to make that either phone call or make that sale or buy that product. And that's, that's a really good investment for those that have a marketing budget is just test, test, test is, is have a company do that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So sounds like there's a lot of good options that you can take without a huge monetary investment to start developing that SEO before you really have that full fledged, decent budget business. So that that's, right. that's helpful to know. So those three steps, anybody listening, make sure that you, that you do those and, and, and get your website optimized so that, you know, get it to load faster, especially. I mean, I know that that's pretty frustrating. You get on a website, it doesn't load very fast. That kind of <laughs> takes you out of it from the very, very get go. So, yeah. And then they usually bounce. You know, if it takes, yep. they say two to three seconds is what you want it to load. Any, any fast or any slower than three seconds, most of the time, people with the attention spans nowadays, boom, they're out. So if your site's loading at eight seconds, 10 seconds, woo. Yeah. <laughs> People aren't, people are bouncing. You're getting a big bounce rate, most likely on your site, which is not good because if you got 10 people coming to your site, you got a 90% bounce rate. You only got one person staying. You got nine other people you're losing. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And it, it, it makes me think of, I had a topic I wanted to talk to you about a little bit earlier that you mentioned, um, virtual assistants. So really I want to dive into the importance of delegation when, when you have a business and, and if you don't do this, like how you might limit how high your business can fly. So I know that this is, this is something kind of in your wheelhouse as far as you got a lot of expertise on this. So I'd like to, if you can just really unpack why that is so important to have that delegation. (laughs) I learned that the hard way. And and it's hard. You're, when you start a business and you're on a shoestring startup budget, it's, it's hard to, to want to pull the trigger on hiring somebody. And even if you know, if you've read Tim Ferriss's book for our work week, because that's where I first learned about delegation, and you know that hiring a somebody in the Philippines to do work for you is five dollars an hour, depending on the work. Say if it's it's just a virtual assistant where they're checking your emails and that kind of stuff. And again, you want to duplicate yourself. So if your rule is only working on effective things, I'm being effective with my time, not efficient with my time first, right? Effective. So you want your virtual assistant to also be effective. You don't want them just checking your emails, doing the things that you don't want to do that is a complete waste of time. You don't want to have them do a complete waste of time either because now you're just paying them to do the the waste of time stuff. So you want to make sure what you're doing, what you have them do. So I learned this lesson the hard way 
when I first started again on that shoestring budget, I read Tim Ferriss's book. I was like, I need to do that. Then I was like, ah, I don't know if I, if I should. So that was the difference. That is the difference. Cause I've really over this last year to have decided full tilt boogie to go on the delegation side, because I, I grew my business from a four figure. I'm stay at home. I'm stay at home dad from four figures up to six. And it probably took 2000, technically 2013 to about 2017, 18, 18 was when my book became a national or a uh, Amazon bestseller in the baseball coaching niche. So it took about five years or so to do that. But what I was finding years past that was that I wasn't able to scale beyond that because it was just me. I mean, I had a graphic designer, which would do different things for me. I had a developer because those are the two things I'm terrible at. I've been forced to do some development on my own, but very amateur. And I've had to hire people to do that for me. And then the graphic designer, I have no sense. My wife can tell you no sense of graphic design whatsoever. So those are the two that I knew I needed and, and I couldn't live without them. I tried doing that on my own, but it was, it was a mistake. So those are the two I knew I needed, but then saying, you know what? I can only do Facebook ads because Facebook ads are their own thing. Like you have to spend a lot of time on Facebook ads. And that's what I found I was doing. So I would do SEO. I was doing it hot and heavy from 2008 to about 2014 and found out that that in itself was a lot and then switched to Facebook ads. And then my SEO skills got weaker. So I spent a lot of time on Facebook ads and I grew my email list that was stale at the time, about uh, 3,500. I would gain some and then I'd lose some, gain some, lose some, and I wasn't gain. So I went in Facebook and started doing ads and things like that. And I ballooned my list of, of at, the, at this date, over 100,000. Um, but you got a lot of people that, that will unsubscribe and things like that. So I'm at about 35,000 now on my baseball, on the baseball side of things. But what I found out again was, shoot, I spent all this time on face, Facebook advertising. I, I couldn't keep up the SEO stuff. So now I'm coming back to the SEO stuff because now Facebook going through some different changes right now. And, and I'm just waiting until, you know, it's really expensive right now to spend on ads just because of what's going on with them and Apple fighting each other. Yeah. So I, I've kind of opted out of that and come back at a later date. But I came to that realization that I couldn't do everything in marketing. I couldn't do the Facebook ads, do the sales funnels, create the products, do the SEO. I couldn't do that all myself. So I, of the two virtual assistants I have right now, um, outside of the graphic designer and developer, so that I have them, they, they're already on board. But I have one, I got lucky with uh, Kabir out of Pakistan. He's a tech guy. So he's taken over all my SEO stuff. So he does all the tech, the tech SEO. He will eventually move into more of a leadership role and he will manage other techs, other SEO techs underneath him. So he works that side of it. And then I have a, a virtual assistant, another one that is in the Philippines and she's awesome and she's really good at outreach. So we're doing a lot of stuff with podcasts. That's how I met you, Eric. Uh, so she's doing a lot of the, the outreach in that and, and that kind of thing. So they are both doing things that I need to do, but I couldn't do them myself or else I would just be stuck in that one mode and I couldn't go beyond that. So I hope, I hope that's a lesson for, for those out there that even if they're on a shoestring budget, they go, okay, I understand that. If I want to grow beyond six figures, me, myself, which my goal is seven to eight figure business. If I want to do that, I have to have a scalable business. I can't be the bottleneck in that business. So when you get to that point, your readers out there, when you get to that point, you, you to be able to scale, you have to have systems and processes in place. And that that will be people doing those processes. Yep. Yep. And it makes me think of the just the work-life balance as well. Like you mentioned earlier, you, you have a family, you have other things that you want to spend your time on. So you would be strapping yourself thin if you tried to do all those things. And, and clearly you saw that even doing that and putting full effort into that, it's still hard to get that job done. And, and your business is, you know, it's only able to go so far if, if you're the only the sole person putting that time in. So yeah, I think that really, really helps a lot and, and, and should motivate people. Uh, definitely don't feel discouraged if, if you're listening and you're thinking, gosh, like there's so much to do and how do I delegate? Mm-hmm. I, I, I found in, in this just small time that I've been a podcaster is just taking small steps. So just making sure you're progressing in the direction each day. So that, that's something that's worked for me. And, and Joey, I'm sure that, you know, throughout your career and throughout the, you know, being an athlete and an author and having a business, you've probably had this definition change a little bit throughout your life. But I really want to ask you, what what is your definition of the word success? How do you define that term? Yeah, good question. It's different for everybody. Uh, like you mentioned, my my things are God, family, and then everything else. <clears throat> so we got that work-life balance. 
And so that is the, for me, the definition of success is being able to balance work and what your, how much family time that you're with your family. And I, I made the decision early on that I wanted to be a stay-at-home dad, that I wanted to work from home and I didn't want to do that. Now, some, some of you out there, you have no choice. You have to be out working for UPS or working for Walmart or Target, whoever, for, uh, as of now, until you can get to a point where you can't. I made that decision early on and I just kind of pushed through that because I wanted to be close to my family. And then that also represents a problem too, because as you start to get more busy, you start making more sales, you start making more relationship connections, things like that, and getting phone calls and texts and Zoom calls and all, all these kind of things. Well, now you're at home, but you're not, a, not at home, right? You're, 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 you're not there. You're there, but not there. So that part of it, you got to know when to turn on and when to turn off. And that's what I try and do. I will get all the effective things done of that day that I wanted to get done. It could be one thing. It could be two things. Uh, threes usually is pushing it because you're trying to get big things done. And then I will shut it off for probably around three or four my time, eat dinner, do the family thing. And then when the family goes to bed around nine o'clock, I'll put in another hour or two at night, depending on what else I need to finish up or maybe want to want to um, start and finish before or get started. And then I can finish the next day. So I make sure that I have that family time built in and it's just, it's a hard lesson sometimes for some, because you think that you got to be working all day long, like Gary V talked about, right? You don't want to do, you don't want to be working all day long, which you also don't, don't want to not work at all. You got to find out what's effective, what, what's being effective and what is being efficient. And you, you don't want to, you don't want to have efficiency being your, your, your first one. So that, that's what I would say is a success to me is having that balance, that work life balance for sure. Yep. Yep. I know that resonates with me a lot and hopefully others listening I mean, that'll resonate with you and, and just know that, you know, as you're working towards these things in your life and, and going through these business development or just personal, personal and professional development, as you, as you go through life, just to not be too hard on yourself. I think that's, that's been one lesson that I still, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> preaching to myself here. I still have a hard time with that. So, so, you know, I think it, it takes time, but um, yeah. So I, I do have one last question, Joey, sure. before we get off here. And that is, what does it take to rank a business on the first page of Google? You mentioned that earlier. You kind of describe a few of those steps. But if I was to come to you and say, hey, I want the Eric Mueller show to pop up on the very mm -hmm. top when you type in the word podcast, what would that take? Mm -hmm. So interesting. So there, so there's the technical aspect of SEO, but there's also the, the, the strategy side of it. So the El er Eric Mueller show, I don't know if people, until you get big, you know, like Gary V they're, they're searching Gary V. If you put up, right. you know, probably Gary V not his full name. Cause some people probably don't know how to spell his, his last name. That's why they call him <laughs> Gary V. Right. That's why he calls himself. He's branded himself Gary V. But in the beginning, when you're just starting off, you have to think of what your main, what the main idea and theme of the, so I'm thinking we're talking about podcasts right now. Right. So the main theme of your podcast, what's the purpose of the podcast? How does it really, really help people? What's the main, main root, middle foundational thing? So that thing would be what you want to rank for. So what we did, here's a good example. We're starting a, a podcast for the, the search engine optimization stuff. So what we're doing is we're doing lead generation strategies podcast. I could have called it lead generation SEO services podcast. I could have called it like a, what our company is, even though those are search terms that, that we're targeting. But what I want are the people that are coming to the podcast or find, find the podcast are looking for either lead generation strategies or those that, uh, whether they're newbies and trying to get lead, lead generation strategies, or they're more seasoned people looking to gain knowledge or maybe a couple extra strategies that they didn't know about from others. So you want to, it's good to have your name because that's a branding thing, right? So you have your name on there, but when you want to rank, you want to rank for the main thing that that podcast is, is for. So that is, that's the first thing. So you want to make sure you have a, a good strategy, a keyword strategy of what's, what keywords you want to rank for. You want to just rank for your name. If you're brand new, people don't know who you are, right? You're, exactly. you're Gary V or Tim Ferriss or whatever. So the next thing would be the technical side of ranking on the first page of Google. So there are a couple of things. One of the things over the last three, four months that we've learned that is really big is we call write and rank. It's a write and rank strategy. So what it is, is we're taking certain keywords, we're writing up a homepage that's like 
three to 4,000 words homepage instead of having like a 700 or 500 word, have a bunch of photos and things. Although we'll put photos in there, but Google loves content. And the more con you, content you have, that's very helpful. And again, we're taking keywords that people are, are already searching and we're putting them throughout that content. And we're using that, those keywords to create that content. So it's already, people are already searching it. And we're just creating a homepage that gives them all that info. So Google loves that, number one. So we've done that with lead generation SEO services. We have a partner, a marketing partner and I both have um, a gold investment site and a crypto invest, uh, investment site. So we've done the same thing for those. And what's interesting is hitting Performance Lab, we didn't do the right and rank there. So I probably have around 750 pages on that homepage, but it's a bunch of links and informational stuff, links to top blog posts and, and things like that. So I didn't do that with that one. And we're, we got a lot of link juice going to the hitting one, but it's still, we're, we're pulling down its rank, which is good. So we're the lower you rank, the better it is. So if you go on alexa.com and hit their free website, um, I think they, I can't remember what they call it, website traffic or whatever. And you click that, you can put your site in and it'll give you what its rank is overall of the billion websites that are out there. And the, I think the hitting performance lab one, we had it as low as almost under 500,000, which is good. The lower the rank, the better. So it's like golf, right? The lower the, the strokes, the better. Yep. And then it, uh, Google changed your algorithm and then boom, it got blasted back up to 3 million or something like that. And now it's down to like 1.1 million, but we didn't do right and rank with that. We we've only done right and rank with the SEO site, the gold and the crypto, and all those are ranked between six or 700,000 and 300,000. And we haven't any link juice. So I don't know, maybe, maybe Google is, gives you a little bit of a bump in the beginning. And then as the site goes, then they start to, but that wasn't like that with hitting performance lab. So right and rank is big. And then, then you start link juice, what I call. So you, you're doing just uh, submitting your website to directories, or we call them citations. So directories, you have guest posting on sites with high credibility, right? That rank high on Alexa.com. And then you have your backlinks. So those are the, those are the other three big ones. And then using your, your main specific keywords and your title and your description, you know, your website description and title and that kind of thing. But overall, as a, like a 10,000 foot view, mm -hmm. those are some powerful ways and the AMP, right? And the things we mentioned earlier, uh, accelerated mobile pages, that's going to be big because it's it's going to show Google that your site loads really quickly. So um, so that should help. And on a budget, you know, you can do some of those things or all of those things on a budget. Uh, if you got the money, then do them all, obviously. But yeah. those will definitely help for SEO getting on, on the first page of Google. And your search terms are, again, bottom of funnel, right? Bottom of funnel types. It's easier to rank for those lower keyword volume per month, but easier to rank for. And those are more your customers that are ready to go, right? For those businesses out there, those roofers and plumbers and stuff like that. And then if you're looking to educate people, which a podcast is educating people, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get people in, you educate them. They love your, your show. And then at the end, you either have sponsors or you have your own offer that you can do. And that's how you get those you you turn those top of funnel people into bottom funnel just because of the, the the content that you create. So the podcast itself is a little different the the environment because it's more of a, a you're you're educating people on on what you're doing and then yep. you sell them at the end right you have a call to action at the end. Yep. Yeah, man, Joey, that that's phenomenal. I I I have so thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and learning and and really. I mean, I hope everybody listening is just honestly really blown away by by what you've shared here. That's. SEO is not something that I am an expert on by any means. I've been learning about it more and more as I've developed a couple websites and things, you know, mainly just using Wix or Squarespace, yeah. like some people, you know, are familiar with. You don't really have to know how to code fine. to do that. Yeah. So I, I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your expertise. And, you know, really, you mentioned crypto. You mentioned a couple other things that I really have a high interest in as well. So might mm -hmm. have to have you back on for a second interview and an encore episode at some point in time if, if that interests you. So. Yeah, of course, Eric. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. I, I'm, I'm all about sharing. And that's what this thing, that's what this whole, I think, new business economy that's going to come out of all this craziness and chaos of, of now, I think that no like and trust factor is going to be huge. There's a lot of people right now with their yellow flags and red flags up whenever they hear somebody talking about business or somebody talking about an offer or, or whatnot. And I think the ones that are going to get ahead are the ones that are, that are freely sharing. Now, you don't have to give away your services or products for free. But there's a way that you can earn that know, like, and trust credibility with your audience that will help, I think, in the long run versus somebody just trying to sell somebody right away without them know, liking, and trusting you. Yep. Yep. 
Well, that's great. Well, Joey, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you being on. Really appreciate all the advice you've shared. And, and I, I look forward to following your journey as, as well as everybody on the show here. Keep, you know, keep up with Joey and get on his website. And, and, you know, if you need services, if you need SEO uh, help, you know who to go to. Thanks, Eric. My pleasure, brother. All right, Joey. Take care, sir. All right.